This is Fam Electric Ghost, and we're live on the air for the first time with Daryl Stevens, co-founder of the Base Poller app. Welcome to the Fam Electric Ghost podcast. How are you doing tonight? Doing good, doing good. I appreciate the opportunity to speak with you. Well, it's always great to talk to new people, you know, and uh, we're actually, to let people know where we are with this, we're at episode 953 of our podcast. We've been on air since 2016, tracking on Apple Podcast. So that's always cool. They're getting closer to the thousandth episode at 1000. And uh, for those of you just listening, we have your link tree up for base Poller, and that'll be fully click clickable. We'll talk about that more. And uh, this episode, we're going to talk about all kinds of things related to music because everybody knows I'm a music producer and synth head. But um, what we're going to get into is the topic is how will AI change the music industry? I'm very interested in that because I have my own opinions on you know where it is, and I use it to a certain extent. Mm -hmm. But we'll get into that full di discussion. But again, and um, welcome to the show, and uh, thank you for, again for being on you know the program. Absolutely, absolutely. I'm looking forward to it. I'm looking forward to it. So I mean, that's a, that's a huge topic right there. How will AI change the music industry? We can go in several different directions with that. Several different directions. Yeah, yeah. So I'm looking, looking forward to getting started with that with that question. Yeah, because one thing, I mean, just being a musician, I mean, I kind of got into a little bit of AI with mm -hmm. Roland. They introduced um, this thing called an intelligent arpeggiator into some of their modern Roland uh, synths, like the Jupiter X and a Juno X. Right, right. And it's still a synth, but it has this capability that it will actually start writing bass lines and drum lines based on how you play. And I kind of like mm -hmm. that use of AI rather than the use of AI that says, let's take Drake's voice and use it on some, you know, Lil John's song. <laughs> I don't know if that's right. the best use of it, but I know I know some people are doing things like that rather than, you know, I'd like to use it in a studio and say, hey, why don't I use the same kind of Neve board mix that Fleetwood Mac did on Rumors and put that on my song? I think that's a different, that's, that I can see that as being, that's productive. That's cool. That's using something to help me rather than mm -hmm. replacing my writing style. Yeah, I see, I see both of those being relevant. Um, you know, be able to, to mimic different kinds of instruments really well. That's one, that's one use of AI. But I also see what I see AI having a huge impact in is songwriters so for instance if i can use drake's voice if i can even go back and use like i'm a big curtis mayfield fan or a big um you know mm. nina simone mm. fan right and so as a songwriter if i can if i can write a song in whatever style i want to write it in and then i can use nina simone's voice i get part of the publishing right so i get part of royalties her you know she's she's uh passed away now but her family gets part of the publishing rights um you know, and that's all that all be negotiated. But as a songwriter, now now the onus is on me. I can write a great song that can connect with people, and I can have a catalog of different, you know, past artists, present artists that I can that I can kind of use their voice on my songwriting, and they can I can I can foresee a future where they can you know lease their voice out for different projects, and they get they get a huge cut. Obviously, it'll be negotiated, but they would get a huge cut for that. I can see the music industry going in that way. And then the yeah. stars would be the stars would be the songwriters, people who can write a song that connects with the people using the using whatever voice they want to use, but the actual the song itself is what connects with the people. So I can see it going that way. Um, another thing I can see is the mixing and mastering of it. So, you know, if I have a recording, and this this has all kinds of ramifications. So if I if I record in let's say a bathroom, but with AI, I can I can take that you know that dirty recording. And I can clean it up and make and it sound it pristine. Yeah, yeah. Then that has ramifications because at that point, what is the use of a recording studio? You know, why would I need a recording yeah. studio if I can make a pristine recording, no matter where I record from? Because AI can clean it up and make it sound like I recorded in a grade A recording studio. So there's a there's a lot of different ramifications from where uh, AI can do to the music industry. It's it's kind of it's scary, but I think it's going to turn the entire. I mean, every industry is going to turn upside down. But I can see it completely revolutionized in the recording industry. Well, well, I think you know I'm a synth head, right? I'm a sound designer, 
And right. and a lot of people, if you go back to the 60s and back to the early 50s, right? Dr. Robert Moog, who created the Moog, got a lot of mm-hmm. resistance from classical musicians and acoustic musicians. And they say, what the heck is this big old Moog thing? It looked like a computer. That's not a musician. That's not an instrument, right? right. And people argued until bands like Sun Ra and Miles Davis and some of the jazz guys started looking at it. And Herbie Hancock is like, we can use this. Right. So, right. so there's always been an argument that you know, going back to even when Dylan went electric, he, the folk people said he was a Judas, you know, they like the, at the big folk festival, where he finally went electric. The people argue they shouldn't do that. So, you know, using technology has always been this big um, critical point where people say, oh, shouldn't do that. I think the big problem is if you go back to like the original hip hop, when they sampled and they didn't credit people and people mm-hmm. didn't get licensed and they didn't get paid. That to right. me is the problem. Like, like as long as the original artist or the voice or the person you're using gets the royalties that they deserve, and you're not kind of ripping them off, mm-hmm. I think that then the, the moral issue of it goes away. Then the question is like, how do you use it? Because like the Bomb Squad with samples, or De La Soul with samples, they're the brilliant. And some people right. used to look at it and say, well, you could be lazy with samples and not do something very well constructed. And then right. it seems like you're kind of not really putting a lot of art into it or you can be like the bomb squad or dale the soul or any of those great bands that show that you can be an artist with that you know right. any great dj you can see that you can be an artist of what how you choose in what moment you choose to switch to something or the layering so it's you know you could argue you know that but i just think the the, the licensing and the people making sure they don't like just take take somebody's work without crediting them i think it's kind of like you know yeah, if, if you if no. you do, uh, you know, plagiarism. It's like that, that's right. my whole thing. I get that people can, I can valid argument there. Yeah, no, I agree. I agree completely because I'm a hip hop head. You know, De La I was a huge. I'm a huge De La fan. I'm a huge Tribe fan. They use a lot of samples to it. Use a lot of samples and flipped it really well. P Rock, you know, uh, um, um, Premier. All they, they they, you know, they flipped it in a really creative way. But like you said, as long as you give the the, the original creator. Uh, credit for it, and they get the, they get their cut of it. Then I think that it's something that's that that can be beneficial, you know, to both parties, the person who's flipping it and the person who originally created it. That, that's where I see, like when I said with AI, you know, whoever's voice or likeness that I'm using, uh, if I'm a songwriter, whoever's voice and likeness I'm using to actually record, to actually sing the song or, or perform the song, um, they have to get a cut of it. Otherwise, you're right; it's just taking their voice, it's just it's taking yeah. their likeness. And not giving them a piece of it, so that's. And I don't agree with that at yeah, all. They, yeah, yeah, and they, I think you have to give them a, a right. They even their their um, whoever owns their catalog, right? Like if they suddenly say, "Well, I don't want John Lennon," like Yoko Ono says, "I don't want John Lennon's voice being used that way," and they tell you, right. "No, cease and desist," then you right. got to cease and desist. Right. So you you could do it, but you have to kind of make sure that you you know dot the i's and cross the t's because like if, if they say they don't want it mm-hmm. they don't want it you know so so right. that's where i think you know th- that that's the, the artist rights or the who owned the masters are gonna you know have some say in that to a certain extent but right. um as long as you you you're, you're you're diplomatic and you you work it out it's how you approach it you know some people might not approach it in the right way and then they get they get hit <laughs> mm-hmm. and i even think something different like you know hip-hop you know, they a lot of producers would just they just do it. They'll just go get a record, sample it, put it out, and then on the back end, now you got to uh, you know find the people and, and and give them their cut. What I'm thinking of is a place where on the front end. So on the front end, you know, a, a fab if it's a artist that's deceased, whoever owns the right to that catalog has to proactively say, I want their voice and likeness to be able to be used in song on the front end. So then, as a songwriter, I can say. Okay, let me look through this list of people who are approved and who have, you know, mm-hmm. selected to have yeah, yeah. that voice. Well, that makes it easier. That yeah, it makes it easier on, on the front end. Otherwise, you know, you're going to, like you, like you said, you're going to run to a wall where it's like, okay, now I've already used it. Now the song's already gotten big if it gets big. Now yeah. they have all the leverage. I use I, yeah. I use the voice already. Now they can go <laughs> and say, you know, I want cease and desist or I want 95% of the proceeds. Well, that's me. You get the Ice Ice Baby situation where Queen comes back and says, David Bowie and Queen say, no, we didn't right. tell you you could use that. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> you know, it's like, uh-oh. Yeah. 
I guess I messed up on that one. <laughs> uh huh. Yeah, yeah, it's been but, it's been a uh, lot yeah, of cases. Yeah, it's been he read that yeah. that track was just straight up taken from them. I mean, they didn't even try to flip yeah, it at all. It just, yeah, it well, that's taken. what I'm talking about being being lazy. Yeah, like like because mm-hmm. like if you like I've got you know I'm I'm kind of crazy, but I use Euro Rack analog samplers. Okay. okay. And they can go and take a sample and then use controlled voltage to take a like an oscillator and then use the oscillator to randomly move it around. Okay. And so then if I do something like that and then I run it through all kinds of filters and you know low pass filters, high pass filters and I can so much change it so much it's almost totally unrecognizable. Right. Right. And so that takes a lot of kind of like a bomb squad approach of like taking something and turning it into noise, like what you hear on Nation of Millions or something, it's st- stuff like that, like taking field samples and really radically shifting something. That's that's like the creative aspect of that type of work, or those type of tools. And AI can do that. You go on chat GPT and you can start randomly putting in things and say, Well, I want to feel that sounds like you know, I'm taking some kind of Shakespearean thing or I take something from, from like Citizen Kane or I do this. You, you can do all kinds of things that will be kind of, wow, that's really weird, abstract, rather right. than it's totally obvious mm-hmm. and it's taking something straight like Ice Ice Baby. <laughs> right, right. So as a producer yourself, would you feel kind of cheated? Because you, like, you're a purist. Like, you get really deep and heavy into the sense and how to manipulate it, how to, you know, put different filters mm-hmm. on and stuff like that. What if AI, what if, you, you know, with AI, I can do the same thing that you do and take, you know, you've studied it for years, you know, different techniques to make it sound exactly how you want it to sound. If I can just tell AI, this is how I want it to sound, like you did all this stuff, and I can just, you know, play this a regular keyboard with all the bells and whistles that you've studied for years, would you feel kind of cheated as a producer? Uh, I still feel that when I'm working with my modular analog sense, it, what I've been able to detect and a lot of purists will to say this is like if I've got a Hammond B3 or an, an, a mini Moog and somebody's okay. got a software version of that, right? If you actually put them on the oscilloscope, they don't sound the same, right? right. It's just almost like if you recorded it on an old Neve board on reel to reel tape, you might think it sounds the same, but if you really check it, it doesn't. Mm-hmm. And so the, pro- the the issue is like if when you actually see people, you know, perform, they actually have like a real Juno or they have a Jupiter, or they have the, 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 an, ARP, an ARP, or there is there is a difference. And so you can get close to it. And so the, if it's people who don't care about it sounding authentic, but if you want mm-hmm. something to sound like, you know, Stevie Wonder sound songs in the key of life, mm-hmm. or something to sound like Herbie Hancock, you probably got to use the Hammond and you got to use the, the mode. And so you can get close to it, but you won't actually hit it. Okay, okay. Even with AI, you still don't think you'll be able to mimic it. That, no, it doesn't really hit it because still it's, it's it's still digital. It's digital and it's compressed. It's not analog, and analog can get is is analog is like old time circuitry. It's not digital, and there's a lot of compression in it. Right, and if you right. actually, you'll you'll notice that people say, "Well, I do all this stuff on my DAW," but when they go to the studio and somebody actually has a real Moog Mini Moog and they put the mm-hmm. baseline on, they actually can hear the difference. Yeah, I can hear, like, it's almost like you'd be able to hear the difference between like when I listen to a CD and listen to a record. It's, it's warmer, it's a higher low end, it's more compressed, yeah. like you say, all that kind of stuff. But what I'm saying with AI, and I might be wrong, we'll see, but I think it might be able to get to the point where it can mimic, where you won't be able to tell if it's analog or if it's digital. Because it can, it, you, 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 but you yeah, still don't the, 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 yeah. to get it. Still be able to, it still won't be able to mimic it. Well, the problem is, is like the AI is dealing with totally digital machines. If mm-hmm. the AI is triggering a MIDI on a mini Moog, yeah, mm-hmm. fine. Then they could do it. My point right. is if the AI is triggering a digital synth and a digital oscillator versus a, vid- a VCO, which is a voltage controlled old school kind of transistor oscillator, you can hook a MIDI up to an old school VCO and right. AI could trigger that. But if it's a DCO, a digital oscillator, mm. and it's 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 AI triggering a digital oscillator, it's never going to sound like the VCO, even if AI is writing the melody. It's not right. going to actually sound right. So it, it, theoretically, you could have the AI triggering analog machines. You mm-hmm. could have it trigger, you know, a, a, a real piano that's got MIDI hook up to it. Mm-hmm. But 
you've got to actually have that acoustic instrument to actually connect to or that analog instrument for the AI to trigger. In that situation, you can theoretically have it where but if it's totally within the digital space, mm -hmm. I think you get the problem with digital is very clean mm -hmm. and it's very perfect. But you'll if you go back and listen to something from the 70s or the 60s or the 50s or even the 20s and the 30s, you'll start to hear the differences. You, yeah. The modern yeah. stuff is super clean, sounds yeah. perfect. Pristine, but there's right? something about that perfect that's not the same as listening to a James Brown 78. It's right. I, I agree. I agree with that totally. But what I'm saying is I think that AI will be able to mimic that. Like our voice is analog and AI is doing a very good job of mimicking voices. You know, and I know I know that there's a lot more that goes into, you know, mini moog and all that kind of stuff. But what I'm saying, is I, I agree with you if we're just talking about digital versus analog. But when you're talking about AI that can that can take all that can digest all of this input, you can feed it. What was the sound analog versus digital? And I would think eventually, it, even if it's not now, eventually they'll be able to mimic the difference between analog and, and, and digital, be able to identify that, um, that it, and put it in an equation and then add that to the music, or add that to the sound. Right? Yeah, it, it, it really depends on um, the quality of the, the, the oscillators you're dealing with. There are some modern digital oscillators that can mimic vcos but okay. what they've done is they've created this new technology that actually remaps a digital chip to look like an analog chip to okay. look like an analog transistor so there is technology that does that fgpa is the tech there's mm -hmm. a bunch of companies like roland does it roland has this thing called fgpa and it mimics the transistor structures of the jupiters and the sh-101s and it pretty is pretty close to really being what the jupiters were Right. But when you still put it against the oscilloscope, it doesn't fully match. Okay. So even though it's really close, it, mm -hmm. it doesn't fully match. Now, eventually, you know, give it another 10 years, they're probably going to get to a total match. But, you know, the one thing that is hard to describe is um, analog machines have a lot of controls that are on them. And okay. the control is kind of like the sliders or the draw bars on an organ. And so when somebody's playing an organ and they use those draw bars, that's mm -hmm. a human interaction that right. they're using the foot pedals and the draw bars. Synthesizers have tons of controls on them that if you, when you have just a PC and a mouse, they don't have that. And so what happens is the human factor of the musician mm -hmm. is kind of like a person on a Stradivarius. There's right. something about being on that instrument. The human factor mm -hmm. is always going to be better than a machine. I don't care if it's AI or not. Yeah, I thought I, I I thought the same way until I started looking at some AR artwork. I thought there's a human element that you never can a human level of creativity that you never can fully capture, that you never can fully mimic because it, it's it goes to depend on how deep you want to get with it, the soul, you know, all of that, like individuality. But when I started seeing some of this AI artwork they created, it was so unique. That is, it's like how it brings up the question: What is the human element? Can it be mimicked? Can it be copied? Like I know we just talking about in the realm of music for this conversation, but mm -hmm. in art and writing, like the writer strike going on, people writing script, uh, AI with the possibility of writing scripts um, with a high level of creativity and engagement in the script, um, it brings a lot of questions to the forefront. You know, like what is what does it mean to be human and have creativity? Well, I think it's something about the the random element of human behavior is um is kind of like what they call the stream of consciousness. Mm -hmm. The stream of consciousness, the kind of ability of a guy like Orson Welles when he did Citizen Kane, he didn't really know what he was doing. Right. right. He per if you actually read about when he did that film, he said mm -hmm. the reason that um it came out that way is because I didn't know what was wrong. Mm -hmm. I did things that people said you're not supposed to do, right? Right. But right. this is what happens. So if you're the thing about AI is it learns from anything that has already been done. It takes mm -hmm. pictures from all the pictures that already existed and it randomly moves them around and it right. makes stuff that looks like it's original. But if you actually trace it, there are actually lawsuits where artists are saying it's actually using their original work. Mm -hmm. Right. And you might not right. know that it's not fully AI that did it. It's taking somebody else's work that it learned on. 
So it's right. still the human element that created that original piece, right? And that's yeah. that's the problem right. is like, is the AI gonna know? It's it's using algorithm, which are rules. Humans right. break rules. Right, right now. But what they're working on is general AI, where the starting point is what was fed to it. But then it can teach itself. You know, they, it can teach itself new rules. It can teach itself new things. The starting point, you're right, is but whatever we feed to it, whatever we program it, that's the starting point. But if that's just a starting point and it can learn on its own from that point, like sky's the limit. Even if, even if we have a starting, even if we give it a starting point, if it can repro basically reprogram itself to learn, then then that's a whole different ballgame. Well, kind of if you get to the um, Star Trek <clears throat> next generation data level, where uh -huh. you basically have created AI that is duplicating human behavior almost mm -hmm. exactly, right? So right. you've got a clone right. of a human being. But the problem is, no matter what you do with, with computers, the human mind still has more processing computer power than any mainframe or ma ma massive system that's ever been generated or created. Up to this point. Up to this point. And right. it, it's, they've never seen, the, even with the AI, that's been exceeded at any level because we don't even use most of our brain. So the right. question is, AI will get very good and it will seem like very close to human creativity. I'm just still not clear on if it can actually be like that data level, science fiction level capability of being a full Android and living its own life and having its own purpose and, and actually acting like an individual. Well, I hope for the sake of us, you're right, man. I hope, <laughs> I hope you're right. <laughs> Yeah, I think it's gonna, you know, there's some things they can do, but you know, like if you're a writer and you look at Chappie GPT and you're like, you know, a classic writer, like they're, you know, you get there like a Rod Serling, you mm -hmm. get to, a, you know, some of the classic writers that have ever written for for TV. Right. And and it's and I've heard some guy I taught had a chat GPT talk and said, yeah, maybe you could write a Law and Order or a CSI script, mm -hmm. but you might not be able to do something like curb your enthusiasm or comedy right. because it right. has it, it, it can do something that's predictable like a crime drama but comedy right. is very unique human mm -hmm. kind of aspect and i don't know if it can actually do that yeah we'll see only time will tell but i mean like i said for, for i hope for the sake of us as as humans i hope that you're right and there's a limit to and there's a limit to it but the more I'm seeing the advancements has been making in the past five years, I, I don't know anymore. I don't, I don't know mm -hmm. anymore. Right. And Kirby yeah, Enthusiasm I mean, I mean, I mean, is one of my top five favorite comedies of all time, comedy shows of all time. And so, yeah, yeah, I was just talking to an AI, you know, advocate, and he thought comedy would be very hard for it to do. Right. Um, just because it doesn't have that kind of data mind. Even data couldn't really do comedy. Even you know next day, you know the, the idea of it was that that was a hard thing for it to figure out because it's not logical, right? And you could right. try to learn, but it's kind of very off the cuff, very creative. Um, and you know whether or not you're just trying to get your own concepts um, together, it's um, I don't know, it's just it's a hard thing to to figure out. Um, it's hard. It would be hard I mean, for to all. Out. Yeah. yeah, if we're thinking about from the from the from the perspective of you have to understand it in order to be able to write for it, I agree. I don't think that you have to necessarily understand the comedy in order to write for it. I think as AI, they can study, they they see what's successful. They see they can see a script. They can see what's successful. They can see um, pretty much all the surrounding stats around what what worked, what didn't work. They can. They can take in everything about the script, everything about what's written, everything about the timing, everything about the cadence. And then you, you can duplicate that without even understanding from a individual level why it was funny, what was funny about it. Are you doing mm -hmm. it is, is mimicking or, or writing based on the beats, basically. So I don't know if you have to fully understand comedy or fully understand any specific genre in order to write well for it. Yeah, I guess it's the point of view. Is like, could you actually get an AI George Carlson or Richard Pryor? Yeah. Is it just yeah. going to try to get the laughs or is it going to have the perspective? And the perspective is a human thing of like everything that Richard Pryor experienced mm -hmm. and lived as that individual, right. Richard Pryor, 
maybe you can do jokes that are like his, but I don't know if you could ever be him as an AI. I, I, I still kind of doubtful of that. Yeah. So that's yeah, we'll funny. see. And Richard Pryor is my favorite comedian. You, you're picking all the greats. You're picking all the <laughs> Kirby Enthusiasm, <laughs> Richard Pryor. That's all my favorites. But uh Yeah. I would I just hope that the human the human spark, like that, yeah, you're not gonna really match him. I mean, even people today don't match him. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And George Carlin. Yeah. Yeah, he's a, he's a second. He's probably top five. Well, he's definitely yeah. top five as far as comedic writing. Yeah, he's probably top three as far as yeah, like just and like that. But I don't know if you have to. You're right. He he talked from his both of them talk and any good comedian, David Chappelle, anybody else, talks from their perspective and their and their life lessons and what they've learned and, their, and just basically their perspective of being a human being, what they've gone through, but. If you're not, if you don't have a consciousness, if you're AI and you don't have a, as far as we know, don't have a consciousness, do you, is, is that really affecting what you, your perspective and what you can say? Do you have to have a consciousness in order to write, in order to create something that other, as long as you study it enough or have enough insight into what people think works, what people think doesn't work, what they like, what they don't like? If I, if I can pretty much digest everything in human history, comedy, everything else, I can duplicate that without even understanding. I, I think, and we'll see, like, we don't know at this point, but you might be right. But Yeah, yeah I think the, the problem is I think you get kind of like, you know, what you see in the industry today in music, mm -hmm. where you see how many people clone Beyonce, how many people clone a group, and you get the numbers. So right. this is the problem, I think, is like, what is the quality of the music? If you just clone Beyonce, or you clone Taylor Swift, and you sound like her, and you mm -hmm. can have beats that are like her, and you can have things, and you get the numbers, but does that satisfy you like Carol King? Does that satisfy you like Donna Summer? Does it actually satisfy you as an original artist coming up with a new idea, like Sun Ra, who is right. very experimental in their jazz and very hard to kind of say what is the Sun Ra sound it goes from bebop to funk to all over the place it's all not just one up. thing right that's where i think ai is going to have a problem of how are you going to be like prince from going to the black album to purple rain to this doing not reinvent you know reinventing himself or bowie reinventing deciding to be the lad insane ziggy stardust you know the different characters he came up with that's the human factor that why would unless you have a personality how are you going to do that you could clone that but would you become the next david bowie character on your own just cloning everything humans had already done yeah but i don't think i understand what you're saying to a sense but what if, i'll say two things one is what if I can use with AI? I can create a voice like a like uh, Adele, best voice, one of the best voices ever heard. You know, her and Whitney Houston, um, the best voices that I've ever heard. I can, if I have the money to purchase the best songwriters on earth, and then I can use AI's voice to do it. It's going to connect with the people. You know, I don't I don't necessarily have to create a whole catalog like Prince of great songs. I can just create individual singles using the greatest songwriters on earth and the greatest voices in the history of earth. And that's a combination that's going to be hard to deny. You know, you can't, you can't deny it. So I'm not, I wouldn't approach it. If I was in charge of a project like this, I would approach it. Like, let me try to have all the creativity, all the um, unpredict unpredictability of the great artists like Prince or Radiohead or outcast all these groups that are like you don't know where they're coming from i can just i can use anybody's likeness i want to anybody's voice anybody's style and then i can get the best songwriters on earth to create songs for that style that's going to be hard to and then year after year putting well, you out know, it's a, it's a, yeah mm -hmm. yeah it's a money-making uh, repetitious formula but I right. like, again, I'm coming from the perspective of I like artists that are innovators, like the Lou Reeds, right. the Miles Davises, the, the people like that. So where are you going to get that 
if that becomes it's all about that. And even if you look back to those original artists like Sun Ra and Miles Davis, they were willing to do things not just for the money, right. to do it for I the agree. art. Right. And so, yeah, yeah, AI will make money. There's no question. The question right. of it is, is like, do I want to, you know, as a, as a listener, would I really want to listen to that? Probably yeah. not. Yeah, that, maybe, for me, maybe for me, because I was like, like, I'm like you, I'm like you, I go deep into music and my favorite artists weren't the best selling artists, right? So all like the artists I love the most, the most usually weren't the best selling artists, they, but they connected with me for a specific reason, right? Like I, I'm a huge Curtis Mayfield fan. He's not one of the best selling artists of that genre yeah. of that time yeah. period, but it, his music connects with me. So I don't know, I, I, you might be right. AI might not be able to mimic that, but what it can mimic are the hits because it can mimic the most popular music and they can make money. Yeah, exactly. It'll become the, 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 yeah, exactly. <laughs> the Motown hit city. <laughs> right. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I mean, if you, you know, hit factor. It doesn't it can just be a hit factor. And if you're gonna take on that project, if you're not a music purist or a music, a complete music connoisseur then you just want to make money off of it, like any other industry. Oh, yeah. Comes down to it's like money. anybody, you know, if you look at the, you know, the, the what happens, like if you look at the heavy metal era, like people had, you know, they had a Guns N' Roses, that's the pure heavy metal band, like a Def Leppard. Then you have the right. ones that are just clones, right? right. The ones right. that stood the test of time and they're still around, the Def Leppard and the Guns N' Roses, mm. right? Because they actually wrote original stuff. The other ones, right. they kind of fell out. They might have had hits. So you can be that hit, one hit wonder. You can keep on running those one hit wonders. And there are people that like that. And you can make money doing that. Is it the question of the art of it? Which to me, going back to the whole point of being an artist is, you know, I've, I always have this conversation with artists is we do it because we love it. And it happens to do well, that's fine. Mm -hmm. But a lot of times, like the purest kind of songwriter, you know, we do other things. Like I podcast, I do other things, I do production. But so right. it isn't the, my goal to hit the million seller. That's not my goal. If there's somebody that that's what they want to do, that's that's fine. The AI is probably the tool you want to use. Hmm. So there might be always, so you might, you might be always a space for human creators. And if you know, yeah, I think there's always going to be a generation of people. If you think about like how, how did Kurt Cobain and Nirvana come through after the age of hair metal? People got tired of the clones mm. and Nirvana showed up on the scene because Kurt didn't care about money. He was coming from sub pop. He just wrote the way he felt like it was, you got a synergy with a guy that didn't really care whether right. he was making songs that were going to make money. They happened to make money. And mm. this is what you get sometimes. And that's a very random element. You get the artist that doesn't really care. Like Prince was one of those, mm. you know, right. he had a chance when he was 17 to have um, Earth, Wind, and Fire, uh, Maurice White, right? To have him produce the first Prince album. He said no. Mm. He said no because he wanted to sound like Prince. Right, right. That's, that the argument. That's the argument I'm making. He could have gone with Earth, Wind, and Fire and made a million dollars on the first Prince record. But he didn't do that. He right. went with his own style where he wanted to sound like him. He didn't want to sound like Earth, Wind, and Fire. Right, but now that we have, <laughs> I, I agree, I agree. But now that we have a whole catalog, a whole discography of all Prince music, so we know what Prince sounded like, we know his cadence, we know his his style. That can be studied. What if someone just can wrote a brand? And Prince was extremely popular too, so it's not like he was an underground artist. You know, he was extremely popular. Uh, and what if we have a songwriter who can write songs in the vein of Prince? And and you can can use his voice and his style, guitar playing, and all that kind of stuff. You can come, you can have a whole new Prince album. You can have a series of whole new Prince albums. And yeah, you, you will, and if you tell if you listen if you are a new generation, if you someone was born, you can get to a point where if you let them listen to the album that was created by AI and that was in the albums originally created by Prince. Unless you live through that time period or you just know this discography like that, I think you get to a point where you won't even be able to tell the difference. Yeah, that could be true. But Prince was so prolific, he actually has like 
10 to 15 years worth of unreleased music that we never even heard. Right. So right. you wouldn't need to run AI on him because there's original stuff that's never been heard. True. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> so, yeah. so my and being a Prince purple head, I would argue that Prince's unique take on things mm. would be hard for AI to actually get to because if you get to what he does, it, it was, uh, you know, maybe he can do it. But what I've heard from AI so far, mm. I've, I've not heard anything capable of doing what he does. Yeah, right yeah, I agree with that. Not yet. Not yet. I agree yet. with that. Yeah, maybe he'll get to that, but, you know. Yeah. You know, yeah, <laughs> but yeah, I think I mean AI is the big problem is is whether or not people use it in in the kind of um, you know cheating way or lazy yeah. way. Right? right, you're talking about writers actually writing new material. My mm-hmm. fear is people just clone when doves cry and then take take somebody else's voice and put it on it and do note for note exactly when doves cry with somebody else's voice on it. Yeah, yeah, that would be that would be that, a problem. That's what I've seen people do so far, uh, and right. so on my my thing has not been like that. They've gone and tried to do something unique. <laughs> right, yeah, it's it's still in the early stages, though. It's still in the early stages, but you know that's a big thing. The other thing that I think that could be a huge game changer was if AI could clean out their records. If I if I made a recording, like I said, in a, in a basement or a bathroom. Oh yeah. That. And they can take that that would be a huge game changer because then that could make that could make recording studios obsolete, you know. Because well, that was- goes, yeah, that only goes into like if you talk to a recording engineer, they probably try to argue that their point of view on on what when they actually listen to every second of a song, mm-hmm. they're running it through their remastering, you know, decks of all this, all these analog preamps and all these compressors and all these things. Now, I have a legitimate point of view where AI could do some of that. Because okay. AI can go through all those knee boards mm-hmm. and all those compressors and all those very you know complicated things that the sound engineers go to Berkeley to learn, that right. type of level of stuff. And they could, you could theoretically, like in the beginning of the episode, I said, hey, Fleetwood Mac rumors went through this famous Neve board, the analog board, and mm-hmm. I want that, that Stevie Nicks compression on her voice on one of those songs. I want to use that same compression, the same settings on my song and right. use those settings and apply those settings to my song, to my vocal, apply McFlutewood's drum settings to the drums, you know, and apply, you know, all, you know, Christine McVie's keyboard settings you know, to the keyboards on my song. And if you could do that, I mm-hmm. think that's actually very helpful because people could say, you know, I want to use Led Zeppelin Four, I want to use like a Sly and the Family Stone record. I want these different mastering styles applied, and I don't think that's exactly cheating. That's actually giving people capability that was so it's so expensive. Those MIDI boards are three hundred thousand dollars, five hundred thousand dollars boards. You can't right. even get that. So, right. giving that to more musicians could actually create a whole new era of really awesome music. Right. No, I, I agree. I agree. But you're you're thinking about it from a position, from the perspective of a musician who's a true musician who loves the art, right? And so I agree with you from that perspective because you're thinking about ways to incorporate it in a way that's artistic, in a way that's that's true to being a true musician. But there, I think there's a whole another perspective that people who are looking at it as a business opportunity, and they don't care about any of that stuff. Yeah. They, no. <laughs> with this yeah and, i mean if you just go for the for the less artistic point of view is i can take a bathroom recording and make it so clean but but my whole thing is a lot of recording isn't necessarily clean when you actually get into the dynamics of what you do with engineering sometimes mm-hmm. you dirty things up sometimes you make things perfect. Not exactly perfect. There's a lot of what we call the happy accident or imperfections mm-hmm. that are actually necessary to make the thing sound better. Um, right. And, right. and so the obvious thing is to just clean it up, get the white noise out, get the bad echoes out. But there's a whole thing. There was a almost level. People win Grammys for engineering because there's a certain level of it that is art. 
and right. they're looking at every second of the record and making choices on all those settings from right. a very artistic point of view. And so the you know to the somebody that had a really bad recording just clean it up. That's the just the high level business use case. But there's a yeah. there's a whole nother level of it that I guess I was going after. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, I, I agree. I agree with that. A lot of my favorite records have, like you said, uh, having mistakes, things that's not like quantized, or you know, with the band, nothing's quantized, but it, it has a feeling yeah. of of having like a swing and a looseness to it, and you you know, so yeah, the Purdy Shuffle. Like, can, right, could yeah. somebody do the Purdy Shuffle, like Purdy? Maybe you can get it, but there's something about. You know, Steely Dan used Purdy, you know, him. Like, everybody used him. But the idea is, like, that real Motown drummer or the stacked drummer. Right. That, you know, even the drum machines today, people can't do what those guys did. Those classic, you know, the Funk Brothers and all those guys. It's very it, – if you listen to those Motown records and you listen to the drum lines, it might seem like it sounds simple. But a lot right. of it is very intricate and very human. And a lot and a right. lot of the drum machines and stuff don't do justice to what those real drummers did. Yeah, I agree. That's why I'm not a huge fan of 80s music. With some exceptions, obviously, Michael Jackson, Prince. I have some exceptions. But yeah, the they got creative with the limb. Drum machine, you know? <laughs> the drum machine came in. I was just like, I need that. I need that real feel of a real drummer more than the drum machine. Well, even Prince ended up using real drummers. Like, you know, yeah. he got sick of it. They, that was a phase. You know, if you actually check the MPG in the end of life, he had tons of drummers, real mm -hmm. live drummers. And, um, but, you know, his programming on the Lynn drum machine in the 808s and 909s, and he was, what was cool is he was very interested in actually trying to use it in a very musician type way, not right. using it as like a, just a cheat to keep the beat, but actually be very innovative from what at his approach. Mm -hmm. Some people don't do that. <laughs> so when yeah. you get guys like Michael and Prince, it's like they like their approach on it. We even like a guy like um uh from, from Genesis, like uh Phil Collins was very mm -hmm. innovative in his use of drum. He's a drummer and he, he used to know, use yeah. drum machines to enhance his own drumming. He would add drum machines and still play drums against them. Right. You know, but right. yeah, so it's interesting to see where to go. Um like I said, I hope for our sake, I hope for, for our sake that you're right. And there's things that AI, no matter how advanced it gets, it won't be able to mimic. I hope, I hope that's right. I hope you're right about that. I think there's always gonna be somebody who wants to go to New Orleans and listen to a jazz band. There's always gonna be somebody that wants to hear a band that's like channeling like a clash or a talking heads. Like if you look at like a, a band like the talking heads, how would anybody ever come up with something like psycho killers? Unless you're David right. Byrne. You know, it's like David Byrne had such a weird sensibility. There's no band that's like them even today. You know, there's certain types of people that there's always going to be room for that human element. But if you go into the what's popular and what will make people money, yeah, there's always going to be that kind of machine driven, you know, we used to call it the corporate rock or the corporate bands, you know, get, yeah. you get created. And AI is going to be part of that. It's going to be the record companies trying to, you know, bring themselves back and create this big movement of these, like, you know, you know, next thing you know, you'll see these, like, you know, fake, well, not fake, but they'll be like, uh, you know, uh, uh, holographic musicians. They're not even real people. Yeah, that's, just, that's, about that. that's, that's the yeah, question. Yeah, holographic AI artist. <laughs> yeah, a completely, a completely created artist, look and everything, create, completely created, and then a hologram. I, I can see people going to a con because they, they've, in smaller senses, they've already done it. But creating well, the gorillas tried to do that. The idea mm -hmm. of the gorillas was was it was just a comic book though. It was, but you know, it was a real band behind it. David Alburn's behind it, mm -hmm. and the comic book guards was behind it. But they all they they wanted to do holograms. They couldn't get people to pay for it. In some case, they think they did a couple of holograms, but they couldn't afford it to keep on doing it with the holograms. So they just right. went with the art. But that's a whole concept of a made-up band of characters. Mm -hmm. But you know, going in the future, a band like the Gorillas could be fully AI holographic. Right, right, exactly, exactly. And that could be where it goes. And like you said, you know, a record label can—they'll be saving a lot of money doing that. We have oh, a, yeah, the AI-generated songs, AI band, have a hologram. 
you get to keep uh, keep 100% of the proceeds because it's not a real person you have to split it with. That's uh, that's something else. I think you're always yeah. still going to have the kind of steer. If you look at like um, Odd Future and Tyler and Earl Sweatshirt and those guys, you're right? You're always going to to me have that kind of entry point. Like he, those guys were just on YouTube, and they were just running mixtapes, and they blew up. Because they had this sense, you know, Tyler and Earl Sweatshirt and that whole Odd Future collective kind of did a grassroots kind of come up, like the punk aspect aesthetic yeah. of like the Ramones, the CBGB scene. I think there's always going to be that kind of scene. I'm very much into like the electronic modular scenes that are in Berlin and Finland okay. and Nor Nor uh, uh, Norway. Norway you know japan like i'm in can, can i connect with a lot of these underground artists that kind of play like me and right. there's still a lot of us around in these kind of small scenes and i think there's always going to be that like the college radio scene or the underground scene or the mixtape scene i think you're going to have that because people want that there's going to be some kid that wants to rebel and say i don't like what's on the radio <laughs> and i right. want something right. else you know no i agree i agree I don't think that's going to cut out because, you know, people are still going to play music. People are still going to write music. People, So you're still going to have musicians. But in addition to the musicians, I can also see AI musicians. AI, you know, AI created everything. So you have this, you have a choice. You know, you can listen to this, you can listen to this, you can listen to both, you know. So I, I don't think it's, I don't think it's a case where it's either or. But I can see as, as the AI, if, let's say for the AI musician, hologram uh, concerts. As that gets bigger and bigger and more um, prominent, I can see record labels dumping more money into that because it's less cost, you know? So I'm not saying that right, the artists eliminated. Yeah. I'm just saying it might I be can see them. Yeah. Well, I mean, I can see them wanting to bring back Hendrix. I can see Warner Brothers yeah. Reprise saying, yeah. hey, if we can get AI to reproduce Hendrix and make a hologram of Hendrix and make him do every single performance he ever did and then put him into stadiums, I can see people doing that, doing that with Jim Morrison in the doors, doing that right. with Led Zeppelin. I can see people, but I think there could be a point where people get burned out. I think the problem with the industry, with the corporate is they, they do something like that. Mm -hmm. And it's big at first. And then eventually people start saying, well, it's too much. So I right. think it's a matter of like, at some point, if they oversaturate or they go too, too much into it, then there'll be a rebellion kind of like what happened with, with grunge. Yeah. You know, it, you know, they'll trigger like another error where people will reject it and go back to go to something that's more honest. Yeah, but it happens with every genre and every in every period. People eventually reject the whatever is late. Like you said, like for instance, uh you're talking about Nirvana replacing kind of glam rock and eventually with the with the grunge. But eventually yeah. grunge got played out too a little bit. You know, there's a lot of people who copycat uh Nirvana, their whole style. So you had all that going through the nine early nineties, mid nineties, and then the whole a whole another turn on alternative music came, you know, or, or rock, whatever you want to call it. Yeah, yeah. It just uh, goes through phases. You mean, you went through phases. Went yeah, through you phase, get so phases like disco. I mean, disco yeah. had a phase and then people say they hated it and they wanted to like destroy right. it and burn it and and yeah. so but now like there's a place for a disco in a subgenre. People still like it. It's mm -hmm. not as big as it ever was, but it feeds right. into a lot of what EDM and techno and trance is, mm -hmm. is that kind of disco mindset. You know, I grew up during disco. And when I see these trance kids and like that, they're, they're still trying to create that feeling that, that was in the disco era. Right. That, that That's what it's just a new form. But, you know, I think, yeah, I mean, we're kind of living in an age where there's like everything. I mean, some people channel 1920s flapper stuff. Mm -hmm. Like we're in an age where bebop, you know, and, and fusion can happen at the same time. You got bands, they'll, they'll channel either all at once, you know. And so, and Pearl Jam's still here. And they still book the massive the stadiums. Yeah. They survive. Yeah. So, I mean, yeah. so, you know. Yeah, now, that's one thing I like about this uh time period in music is there's so many different genres going and also there's, there's this synchronization of different genres like you hear like and then you got the rise of a whole new genres at least in america i know like afro beats is becoming huge yeah yeah you know i mean obviously it's been it's been big in western africa for a while 
but it's like uh it's having a huge influence on hip hop, on pop music, on on uh, like all kinds of music. So is this yeah, well, uh, like world music you know? always tends to crumb creep over, you know? Yeah. <laughs> Cause yeah, sure. I mean like what Prince was getting triggered by uh Kraftwerk, which was a mm-hmm. Berlin progressive synth band, and he yeah. heard it and he's like, Oh, I'll integrate that. You know, mm-hmm. and so if you get deep as a prince, they say, Wow, he's he's influenced by Funkadelic, Parliament Funkadelic, Sly and the Family Stone, Hendrix, and this German band. Right. You know, so he was like he had many, many influences, and that's why he's so wide. And yeah. what I like about it today is that you know, you get country influencing hip hop. You mm-hmm. get psychedelic rock getting in, in, infused into into di- in different types of trance and EDM and stuff. So there's a lot of cross genre. And that's the opportunity where AI, you know, through chat GPD, somebody say, well, what happens if I merge a psychedelic song with a like a, a Johnny Cash song? Mm-hmm. And start flipping this, you know, people start saying, well, what, what what about this combination? What about that combination? If you get people to be very inventive with it, I think it's a cool tool to to yeah. try to, you know, to slam things together. And hip hop has been doing that forever. We we throw jazz and 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 rock and you know you know Run DMC was you know throwing hard rock and hip hop, right. and De La Soul was psychedelic rock and hip hop, mm-hmm. you know. So we've seen that continually. The influence of jazz and a lot of hip hop artists actually have real drummers on stage when they play now, you know, and, and saxophonists right. and guitar players and everything. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's one thing I loved about, uh, like, I was a big Outkast fan growing up. They use a lot of live instrumentation in their music. That's that's one thing I loved about them. So yeah, you're right. Yeah. And obviously, the root. There's a lot of other hip hop groups that, uh, yeah, the roots. Use that yeah, live roots are, yeah. Mm-hmm. So yeah, it's, it's well, I think it's really cool to, to do that. Oh yeah, oh yeah. But I know I really haven't really talked about your app. Yeah, so your the app-based part- parlor thing. The whole point. Yeah. Yeah, the baseball app. So it's uh the baseball app's an app for musicians to connect with other musicians. So like if you're an artist looking for a producer, I like kind of some of the stuff we're talking about. Let's say you're just looking for a whole new genre of musician or artist to collaborate with, you can find that on the baseball app. So what we're working on is building it to it being a global app. You know, right now, um, a lot of musicians, I would say six percent of musicians are based in the United States. But it's starting to expand and become uh, much larger all around the world. So that's where we want to go with it is have these mashups and these collaborations from artists and musicians from completely different genres, completely different parts of the world or parts of the country. And this making the this making good music that crosses all different barriers, all different genres and just uniting. So our, our slogan is uniting the world through music. So that's what we plan to do is, you know, you can find someone anywhere in the world, collaborate with them and uh, create brand new music with them, you know? So through the yeah. app, you know, could like just a tactical question, like, mm-hmm. I have my studio here. I, you know, I can link it to my mixer and and go on to something like StreamYard. And I've actually done collaborations with people using this tool where okay. I've actually, you know, done uh, albums with somebody who lived in California. And we would, I, oh, nice. I try something, they try something, then we kind of send files together. Does it have their ability to kind of do that in real time? Because we were using like Google Drive and then live showing each other, like, here's what I just did on my Moog, you know, and listen to it because it's coming through my mixer and now you can hear it. And then they go do something on the guitar and we they would send each other files and start, you know, playing with it. Is it that kind right. of collaboration? That will be coming in 2024. So it's funny you, you mentioned that. So that's the, uh, that's, that's coming in 2024. Working on that now. We have a show called the Bass Parlor Mashup where, you know, we put two musicians in the studio together and they create a brand new song from scratch. So that's on our YouTube channel. It's a, it's a series we're working on season three. And season three is the first um, first season where it's remote. So the, 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 the artists are in two completely separate locations on different sides of the country and they're coming up with a, a brand new song. Uh, in 2024, in the bass part of rap, you know, you'll be able to actually collaborate with someone in that. So right now you can find someone, connect with them. Y'all can chat back and forth. You can message each other. And then coming next year, you can actually be able to record with them directly on the app and then, you know, monetize that recording. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. yeah so so we, the, theoretically, I could I could have my Moog connected to my mixer and then go mm-hmm. through this app 
and actually play my Moog bass line real live time while they're on a Gibson Les Paul. Right. And, and, exactly. And do that together in sync. That's the do idea. That think in real time, you know, live right there remotely. So you can do that. You can be able to work with anybody, any other, you know, app member uh, right there directly. And y'all be able to, you know, interact, yeah. talking to each other back and forth in real time. And so it's going to, we're really looking forward to it. It's going to be a game changer. Yeah, I'm going to be checking that out because uh, I've done it the hard way where we, you know, we, we, we've kind of, I've met people through podcasts, other artists, and we've done albums together. And right. and we kind of just kept on sending files back and doing like uh, you know doing calls through the conference calls and 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 just kind of doing it that way. But having an app that allowed us to like you know link our mixers together and actually hear stuff real time in sync and not out of sync that would, that that's something we've been looking for for a while. Um, so right. that that would be cool. Yeah, absolutely. Definitely be into that. <laughs> we'll stay connected. We'll stay connected for sure. Because I, I really think that you and uh, yeah, you know, I would beta test that. I, I could be, I'd okay. volunteer to beta test it. <laughs> <laughs> That's a deal. That's a deal. <laughs> yeah, I did some yeah. beta testing for SoundCloud before. Oh yeah, <laughs> on their okay. on their mastering. Yeah, yeah. When they were doing their Adobe Labs mastering on SoundCloud, mm. I did some beta testing for them. But okay, uh, yeah, yeah. That's that's gonna be important. So I will definitely stay connected. And uh, you know, and, and link up because it's going to be something that uh, that you know that me and my team are really, really excited about. It's going to really uh, change music a lot. Well, yeah, because I heard they used to actually have real life sessions for that, right? Before the pandemic, in your story, you used yeah. to have like like uh, things that you did live with people, like that, that would kind of like that triggered this app. Yeah, yeah. So um, before we used to have, so I used to have a recording studio before the pandemic. And a lot of this stuff would bring in musicians and, uh, you know, would have them pair up and create a brand new song right there. And they'd never worked with each other before. And we're doing that now again. So we, you know, we launched the pandemic, shut that down. But I saw the, the huge need for collaboration and, you know, especially independent artists to be able to find someone mm -hmm. to work with. You know, a lot of times it's harder for independent artists to find someone to work with. Um, so that's what we did. I decided to, you know, kind of pivot. And say, so, okay, instead of the the physical location, let me build an app that does the same thing. And that's really been so we hit the ground running, and now we're you know we supplementing the app, and we now we're relaunching our in person what would I call mashups or in person mashups. We bring in a lot yeah, of musicians cool. from the city, yeah, and then they can create a brand new song. We give them we give each team sixty minutes to create a brand new song. We pair in musicians from completely different genres and uh see what they come up with you know in 60 minutes so it's been a lot of great pairings a lot of great groups uh, a lot of hey. great songs created from that so it's, it's it's been really good i'm a believer in stream of consciousness i mean that's why i got a bedroom studio because a lot of what i do is like i find that if i just put my multi-track on and i just start jumping on my moog or my yamaha piano and just right. just record it and, and without trying to overthink it and yeah. then i go back and i fix it and i, and I, I can overdub so, so I might come up with something, come back to it and say, yeah, I, li I really like the first 15 minutes of this hour long tape. Going to splice that out, mm -hmm. start working on it, overdub it, work it out. And, I, and I've I've done that type of work with other people, like, you know, working with people in California or working in Canada and overseas. And, you know, having an ability to do that in an app would be fantastic. I know actually a couple of years ago, 2017, I did a record with a lady in Los Angeles and we were like, wow, we wish we had something like what you're talking about. Right. Cause we, right. we had to do it like our own way, but, um, well, it's coming. yeah, definitely well, it's coming. be cool. In a few months it'll, it'll be released. So yeah, let us know. It's going to be, it's going to be really good. I'm really looking forward to it. And I think that the music world, um, is something that needed for a long time and it's, you know, just hold on a few more months and it'll be out there. Well, thank you very much uh, for being on the show. We kind of have another show coming up, but I want to let people know, again, you have your link tree, Bass Parlor. That's really clickable when we're published. And, uh, you know, we'll probably, we could have you come on the show again uh, when you're sure. when you're ready to uh, promote that new version of the app. Okay. Uh, we cool. like to have people come back. So, yeah, if you want to do that, let us know. And uh, thank you again for being on the Family Electric Ghost podcast. Uh, thank you. And have yeah, a great absolutely. night. You too, you too. Thank you, and I appreciate bringing me on, and I look forward to uh, you know staying connected to you. So, take care. Thank you.
Have a good night. All right. You too. You too.